Hey everybody, Raul here for Bass Musician Magazine, and today we have the extraordinary honor and pleasure of chatting with bassist, vocalist, songwriter, somebody that you've probably seen but didn't even realize it, on stage with Rat, Doken, and at times with Quiet Ride, if I'm not mistaken, Juan oh. Crossier, yay! Hey. Hey, Raul, how's it going, buddy? It's going great. Juan is going great. So excited to have this opportunity to chat for many people that were kids back in the day, as I was when we were all much younger. The influence of Rat on the music scene was absolutely massive, and we're having this opportunity to chat because just released, there's a five-album Atlantic Years set that is certainly something we want to talk about. But as always, I do want to dive a little into the past because people usually don't know. How did you get started in music and particularly on bass? You know, I, I come from a musical family. So my father was a great singer and I had two older brothers and a younger brother. And I remember the Beatles appearing on Ed Sullivan. <laughs> And of course, I was about four or five years old. So what I noticed was my brothers were really excited and they were yelling for my mom and dad to come into the living room. And then I was just kind of watching and they started playing. And, you know, if, if you've seen the footage, the girls were screaming and some of them were crying and trembling. And my thought as a, a little boy was, why are they crying? Why are they yelling? <laughs> Aren't they good? You know, don't they like it? Yeah. You know. So that led to my brothers, like so many others, you know, wanting to start a band. And I was just around that influence. And early on, my brother Tom had a band called The Symbols of Time. And they went on to do a battle of the bands and they won a national contest and flew over to New York or New Jersey. And, and it was sort of a, 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 a big deal for, you know, a band sort of, basically unknown. Mm -hmm. So that influence really kind of made me aware of things that I normally wouldn't have been aware of with music mm -hmm. early on. And so as I went on, I started playing the violin in second grade in the school orchestra. From there, I went to guitar a little bit. And then eventually I went to bass. So I had a pretty early start with music the vi the string section in the orchestra was actually the smallest section so we sort of got ignored a little bit and <laughs> but i took private lessons as well and actually started learning a uh, progressive music on violin you know things like mahavishnu orchestra mm. and things like that early on and so yeah that's kind of how i got started <laughs> wow and what drew you particularly to bass? Because you had obviously choices having been with violin. I mean, we could be talking to a concert violinist at this point. What, what was the turning point that made you flip over to bass? You know, there were several things. As a young kid, you know, your state of mind is such that you're not looking ahead and thinking of a career. In some ways, I used to like motorcycles, dirt bikes. Mm. And so for me, it was like, wow. Should I try to be a dirt bike racer or a musician? Yeah. You know, two pretty different things, right? But I love music, and it was just sort of the natural progression because my brothers were really into a lot of the current things that were happening. You know, Hendrix, Stevie Wonder, you know, uh, just, just the current stuff, the Beatles and so many others. You know, pop music, right? You know, it was changing our society in many ways. And so I sort of, through osmosis, sort of got that influence and really then started thinking, well, you know, guitar is great. Not a lot of bands and a lot, a lot of folks are going to want a violin player. That's sort of limited. I even, in fact, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, I even went as far as getting a Barkus Berry transducer so I could amplify my violin through an amplifier oh, to wow. be in a band. Yeah, you know, so I was thinking early on, and, and so then, you know, I, through friends in school, we started sort of knowing who was doing what, and my brothers had a Fender Precision bass that, you know, in a case, tucked under one of our beds. Mm -hmm. So 
So when they would leave, and I'm going to get probably, they're going to poke at me for this one. <laughs> so when they leave, I would pull the base case out and open it up and just look at it. And it was just like so awesome. You know, such a nice base, you know. Yeah. There wasn't a lot of conscious thought in it. I just sort of gravitated towards the bass, and I really took it on as a bassist, not as a guitar player or a violinist changing instruments. It was like I really wanted to approach the instrument and get the most out of it. So among me and my high school friends in music class, we used to goof off a lot, right? And we were really, you know, to be fair about it, there was a group of musicians that were really good. They were extra I don't know, you know, extra special, if you will, in mm -hmm. a way that they really wanted to advance and learn music that was actually pretty complex. So me and a group of guys started learning stuff like Yes and Genesis and, uh, you know, PFM and a lot of the old progressive groups from back in the day, along with, you know, Return to Forever, Chick Corea, yeah. um, you know, just this stuff that was really difficult to play. And the thing behind it was, the harder to play, the better you are, right? <laughs> you know? So that sort of led to us sort of forming a loosely fit band. And then the issue became, where do we play? And of course, you know, the first thing were, you know, it was like birthdays and bar mitzvahs and, you know. So it, it, we kind of took it from there. And playing bass was something that I just sort of felt like I loved the instrument. I love where it sat in the song, mm -hmm. and so it was just a natural evolution for me. And it was funny because my brother told me, I think it was my brother Louie, said to me at one point, I'll sell you the bass if you give me $100. <laughs> you know, $100 back then was like, you know. A million dollars, yeah. <laughs> so... A girlfriend of mine actually got her mom to give me the hundred dollars and I gave it to him and I bought the bass. Oh wow. And the rest is history, you know. I there just you kept go. going from there. Yeah. There you go. It well was fun. and when you mention that bass, something that always comes to me is kind of the sensorial thing. When you open the case on those, there was a smell that kind of came with it that yes. was that you were like, ah oh. Yes. <laughs> if, yes. You're so right. Without so the sound, right. it was just like, ah, oh, yeah. Yes. Especially, <laughs> you know, those old fenders. Yes. They, they had that uh, that plush sort of velvet, you know, red, you know, inside. Mm -hmm. And it was just really neat. It was a thing. Yeah. It, uh, it was a great bass. It was a 68 Precision. Nice. And so I was glad because some of the pre-CBS Precisions my brother Tom had one that, I mean, it had like a two by four for a neck, you know, just playing a simple riff down there was like, good Lord, I got to yeah. jump around, you know, the reach is so far. You yeah. Know? So this one had a, a nice neck and it felt really good. The pickups were good. It just, you know, it was just fun to play. So then, you know, we, we just kind of kept going from you know, playing birthday parties and, and things like that to high school parties and dances and, and so forth. So I really tried to make a lot of strides quickly. And so when I was about 16, I jumped into my first original band and I could barely drive. My father let me drive our, our old camper to rehearsals. <laughs> you know, and looking back on it now, it was really interesting because I thought these were older guys because they were like in their early 20s, you know, and I had just gotten my learning permit to drive and I was like, you know, about 16 at this point, finally got my license yeah. and I would go rehearse with these guys in Redondo Beach. It was a band called Spike. At that point, I was looking for something, you know, trying to, to progress to the next level, sure. you know, and Spike, they were they were kind of like a sort of Aerosmith-ish band and they had their own material and they were really great players, all of them. The drummer was great, the guitar players were really good. We had a great front man. So it really put us on a different level and before I knew it, we were playing places like the Starwood in Hollywood. Oh wow. You know? Yeah, so I got a real early start in that regard. I got lucky to find that band, mm -hmm. you know, I would mix it up, you know, I'd, I'd try to sort of, you know, just network 
and, and stay as busy as I could because there was so much unknown back then. There wasn't a certain way to do, you know, to get to a record deal. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, that's kind of like how it sort of progressed. And along with that came a lot of hard work, you know, a lot of nights playing bass till I went to bed, you know, uh, applying my music theory, sort of, you know, transposing that violin to bass. Mm -hmm. I mean, can't get a wider spread than that, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it was really challenging and uh, not to bloviate, but the thing that, that really helped for me was knowing what my brothers had sort of gone through as sort of um, an example and then learning music that was um, very challenging but would open up a lot of uh, horizons if you will musical horizons that that were applicable later on for me nice, you know? nice. yeah and so then rat how did that all come about? I'm sure there's people that know the story, but just to fill us in. <laughs> so, you know, back then there was a newspaper called The Recycler, and it was just a, a free paper. You could pick it up at any liquor store. And in the back, there were all sorts of ads, and they had a section, you know, musicians looking for bands, bands looking for musicians, you know, and everything in between. And so people in the Los Angeles music scene were basically trying to jockey for position in the club circuit. You know, a lot of bands would be, uh, you know, trying to play certain clubs and gain, a, you know, sort of a following or a reputation, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so there were various musicians. And I was down here in a place called Redondo Beach in what's called the South Bay of Los Angeles. And there were a lot of good musicians down here. So initially, through networking and playing parties, at this point I was playing high school parties and, you know, just trying to stay as busy as I could, I hooked up with a guy named Don Dawkin. Okay. And we started a trio. You know, because the scene was such that if you played in a band, eventually you'd see most of the groups that were playing or be aware of the names that were playing around town mm -hmm. and bands would break up, musicians would move, one guy would join another band, they changed the name, you know, it was a very healthy scene. So we started docking and we would play shows. There was a place called The Smokestack uh, in Redondo Beach. Eventually that club changed its name to The Fleetwood. But I believe while it was The Smokestack, we opened up for a band called Van Halen. Wow. When, in their very early stages, and they were great, obviously, you know, but they were playing a lot of covers at that point, you know. They were playing songs like Going Down, you know, Man on a Silver Mountain, You Really Got Me, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, and they had, I remember they had Running with the Devil and Ice Cream Man. They had those two songs, I remember. So, you know, through networking, eventually, and The Recycler, eventually I found a guitar player looking for a band, so I, I was thinking about starting another project, and um, so I called the guy, and he had a very deep voice, you know, and I said, hey, look, why don't you come over, and maybe I can play you some songs, and you can play me some songs, and we can see if our styles are similar, you know, as a starting point, right? Mm -hmm. And so I remember there was a knock at my door, my apartment, and I opened the door, and I'm looking straight ahead, and all of a sudden, I'm looking at this guy's chest. I look up. This guy's like as big as a linebacker. Oh, wow. He was huge, and it was Robin Crosby. And uh, so we sat, and he played me some songs. He had a demo that they had made. And I had a demo that I had made with Dawkin when we had gone to Europe. We found Michael Wagner in a studio. And Michael was, you know, just basically the house engineer. <laughs> and we would sneak in. And, and basically, you know, yeah, because we couldn't afford studio time. Exactly. So we, you know, the graveyard shift, and we would get in and start recording as much as we could. So from that came a couple songs that I had written and was singing on. I played them for Robin, and, and I remember he said in his deep voice, he goes, wow, you're better than my singer. You know? <laughs> and I thought, well, thank you. You know, that's a nice compliment, I yeah. guess. You know? And so 
we sort of said, okay, look, let's just stay in touch and let's just see what happens. So later on in time, my brother Tom had been playing with a guitar player named Vic Vergat, and they had been touring with a band called Nazareth. The drummer in that band was an old buddy of mine named Bobby Blotzer. So when they got finished, you know, things were sort of on hold. Nobody knew what was going to happen back then. And so Blotzer wanted to stay busy and wanted to play around L.A. or find someone to jam with. And so he called me one day and asked me if I would take him to an audition. Uh, he was going to audition a band. Okay. The band was not auditioning him. He was auditioning them. Okay. So we threw his drums in my truck. I had a little pickup truck. And we drove uh, to, I think it was Culver City. And they're in a garage, you know, where this group of guys, you know, rehearsing. Yeah. And, but, you know, he dropped them off, picked them up, you know, and a couple weeks later, he calls me and says, hey, man, you know, because we had played together a lot in a bunch of different bands. And good bands, too, you know, progressive bands, a band called Firefox that was very demanding and had really, really neat um, uh, ideas, you know, very creative and unusual arrangements. But nonetheless, he asked me if I'd come in and play, you know. Now, you got to remember back then, being a musician was, you know, a starving proposition. <laughs> You weren't going to make a lot of money. It was a sacrifice, mm -hmm. you know. And so we basically got together, and I learned the set real quick. He said, "Would you, you know, play some shows with us?" And I said, "You know, well, how much does it pay?" And it was like, you know, a really small amount of money, but I figured it was enough for groceries. Yeah. You know, and that's kind of how I thought. Okay, if I do this gig, I can buy, you know, some milk and eggs and some popcorn, <laughs> but that'll put me over. <laughs> so. That led to Rat starting to play with this lineup. We had known, you know, I had known who Rat was just from networking and meeting Robin Crosby and knowing that, you know, he was a part of that. And so, in fact, when I was in Dawkin, we went to the whiskey one night and Rat was playing, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so everybody kind of knew who everybody was. And there were a lot of very innovative groups. There was a band called uh, Sorcery for example, that was literally a magic act with a band behind it. So it was like, like, wow, this is weird. This is going kind of what? It's a magic show with a rock band, yeah. you know? And so, uh, you know, we saw the guys and we all knew who everybody was. And so I went and, and we started doing some gigs together in rap while Dawkins was waiting for Michael Wagner to mix the album that we had sort of put a piece together called Breaking the Chains. Mm. So we brought Michael Wagner here from Germany after jamming with him, you know, in the studio. And the idea was he was going to remix the Dawkins record and we were going to pursue, you know, the next level, get a record deal. However, Michael started working with other bands. He made the Motley Crue EP, worked with Great White, you know, and, and numerous other bands. And we're going, hey, Michael, when are you going to mix our record? You know, so in between that, I said, hey, look, I, I need to work and try to make a little bit of extra money. So Rat was a way of, of doing that. And one of the few ways, I, I was also working with in cover bands, top 40 bands, you know, Again, just to make a living, make ends meet. Sure. Know? And so we started playing around Hollywood. And once we had, you know, we had Robin, Stephen, and Warren, and Bob and I. Once Bob and I came in, in all fairness, and just, you know, I'm just, you know, making sure my memory serves me correctly. And I'm saying this in a humble way. Once Bob and I joined the band, we were a pretty formidable rhythm section mm -hmm. okay from playing in progressive bands from music that was really challenging so the rhythm section between bob and i really elevated the entire group to a level that it had not been on you know and at that point the audience started noticing that and we started drawing more people and the band started you know filling up some of these clubs to the point that I remember one time, Bob and I, about maybe four to six weeks into it, after we had played maybe a half a dozen shows or, you know, um, maybe a couple months, we're pulling up on Sun, uh, Santa Monica Boulevard, we're pulling up the Troubadour, 
And we're looking, and of course we've got our equipment in the back and so forth. And and uh, no, actually, I take that back. I think we had already sound checked, and we were just coming to the show. Mm. And there's a line, and we thought the line was for the Italian restaurant next door to the TV, right? <laughs> yeah, man, there's a line to see somebody or something. Yeah. And we thought, wow, they're they're lining up for the troubadour. And I thought to myself. I wonder who's playing with us tonight, you know, what other bands are on the lineup, you know? And it was actually people lining up to see Rat. Wow. And it just, it really changed quickly. And of course, then we went on to do the EP that we released ourselves. And that really helped us a lot. It helped elevate the band's profile. And we just kept going from there. So. Nice. And the transitional point that caught Atlantic Records, because I think for a, a lot of people, the record companies, as they were kind of scouting so many groups, and you're absolutely right, you were in this huge melting pot, that particular area, kind of so many people that I talked to, they were, you know, either playing the whiskey, you know, this cross pollination of all of this music at the time. But to catch the attention of somebody at Atlantic Records and, you know, certainly coming out of the box with uh, Out of the Cellar, 1984. I mean, huge. But how did that connection kind of come about? Well, you know, you're right. There was a huge, it was like almost like a vortex of bands getting record deals. And, you know, you would hear so-and-so got signed. You'd be like, really? (laughs) Oh, man. Uh Uh-oh. You know, the clock is ticking. Yeah, yeah. You know, the sun is setting. You know, and um, so a lot of labels actually passed on Rat, and we were doing everything we could to get noticed. I remember the first time I heard one of our songs on the radio. I was driving around, and it was on a, a radio station called KMET, and they were pretty big back in the day. And all of a sudden, there we are, and I was just shocked. I mean. I kept driving, but I part of me felt like pull over, hold on a minute, you know. And uh, so we had worked really, really hard. We did a lot of like, for example, record store um, meet and greets, signing records, and you know, just trying to really promote the band as best we could. Mm-hmm. The EP had done real well on its own, so that sort of started catching a little more interest from record companies. It started helping us to stand out from from the others, you know. And that led to a president of a record company, his name's Doug Morris. He had just become president of Atlantic Records. So he was looking to make, I I believe, a statement with his new leadership. That got the interest. He he was interested in rap. And so from there, we sort of had one of his producers come and see the band because uh, producers at that time, you might remember, had a lot of influence on groups and records. They were like the liaison between the company mm-hmm. and the actual band, you know. So Doug had a producer that he had worked with and he believed in. So we decided to go ahead and give it a shot because he was an unknown producer and it was Bo Hill. And so we got together and he came to one of our rehearsals and, you know, we sort of got a kind of a vibe for him and uh, we started sort of working on a couple songs we went into a studio and we recorded those songs everything went well and then that kind of progressed to the next level we because we weren't sure which producer we wanted and you know we had our favorite records you know jack douglas and these names we had always seen you know ted templeman van halen you mm-hmm. know so we didn't really sort of know who would be the best fit, but we wanted somebody that had a reputation, you know, naturally, right? You know, Tom Worman was around back then. So it clicked with Bo. And so he had something to prove. We had something in common because we had something to prove. Doug Morris had something to prove as the president of Atlantic. And so it worked. So once we got through that, let's just call it that demo stage, Mm -hmm. we started getting ready to record what would become Out of the Cellar. And it just happened so quickly that we were in the studio recording the record and the record contract hadn't been signed yet. 
Oh, wow. Yeah. So we were kind of, <laughs> hey, look, you know, we're all in. This is great. We definitely want to record. We love the idea of being on Atlantic Records is awesome. I and mean, that's Led Zeppelin's label, right? Yeah. You know, we're good. So, but uh, what are the terms? I mean, <laughs> wait a minute. Let's look. You know. <laughs> you know, so anyways, to make a very long, obvious long story short, we did the record in about six weeks. The, the record deal was consummated. Everything went well. And we embarked upon what would become, you know, uh, what we're talking about now that led to this box set, right? You know, so it was really interesting. And a thing to sort of realize is the scene was so different back then. You know, you didn't have social media. Mm. Social media was showing up at a club <laughs> and looking around and seeing who was there. That's your social media. You know, hopefully getting a free beer or something for the night, you know. So there was a lot of groups really, really competing to get out of Hollywood mm. and out to where, you know, the big boys play, you know, the arenas and amphitheaters and, and whatnot. It was a really neat time. There was a lot of really good energy and um, it was really exciting. There was a sense of the unknown, you know. And of course, once we did the record, there was, you know, MTV was already kind of gaining traction. Yeah. And uh, so that was a way that we could sort of utilize that, that network to promote the group. So we went in with a producer named Don Letts and we uh, made a video in downtown Los Angeles for Round and Round. <laughs> You know, and then that just kind of continued from there. Gotcha. Well, I'm glad you mentioned MTV because it's interesting because in its evolution, people that watch MTV now don't realize that it was music TV, which it isn't anymore. It's more it should be like our TV because it's mostly reality and, and junk totally. stuff. Yeah. But in its heyday, MTV put faces to the music so that the audience, no matter where you were, you could already start kind of relating to the musician. It put a whole new dimension because, again, when it was just radio, there was a lot, I think, of influence. Uh, radio stations working with companies, the album companies. Uh, a lot of times you, you'd get something saturated and it would just go and go and go and go. And you'd kind of go, okay, well, I seem to hear this a lot. Not all of it was great. Sometimes something would click through and you go, oh, well, that. Or you'd... I, I was one that would call my local radio station and request and, and then wait for hours to see if they'd ever put it through. And usually they didn't. But, you know, MTV made it an, on, kind of a more of an on demand. You could see the group, especially groups Van Halen. I mean, Dire Straits came out with their early computer thing. There was so many I'm, of these creative. It just put such a whole different dimension on it that was was just amazing but it was just this big swell of all of this stuff coming out that was just so incredible and of course you guys from 84 to 90 this is the the time period with this box album had you know multi-platinum platinum gold i mean you on fire for a good <laughs> chunk of time which was yeah. just amazing yeah, it was a good run. You know, with MTV and what was happening in the clubs, it was the perfect confluence of groups with an intense image that a lot of groups didn't have prior to that, or at least it wasn't as out front. And MTV provided the vehicle to get not just the music, but the image of the group into so many houses. Mm -hmm. And in Hollywood, it had been so competitive. As I said, there were even bands that had magic shows, right? You know, <laughs> so image was meant a lot and style. And if the image went along with the music the right way and, you know, you had different like, for example, you had a band like Metallica that was just in its infancy back then. Mm -hmm. But they had an image, you know, it was the denim and leather thing and with patches and, you know, stud stud bracelets their their audience had that image you know and so when mtv provided that avenue for bands not only to get their music out but to get the image into homes it really shook up the the formula and 
at that point, there were so many bands that, you know, had very distinctive images and were unique, you know. So it was just real perfect timing for that to really sort of, you know, upend the music business in the sense that all of a sudden it was this whole new thing that was caught on real quick. Yeah. You know, you know yeah, it was a, a great time. It was who would have known, right? You know? Yep. It is certainly a, a big case of right place, right time historically. And as you mentioned, there's not a fixed path because if somebody were to try to set out to replicate what you did, where you went through, it, it's impossible. The planets are not aligned in the exact same way anymore. So as we mentioned, MTV, totally different thing. Music videos, totally different thing. I mean, it is it is so changed up. But one last thing I'll mention about this, one, one of the, the great things about a box set like this, I think a lot of people like myself back in the day, we wouldn't be, I didn't have the money to scrape together to buy records. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and, I know. And so it's not until you got to your latter years that you'd go, oh, I've always wanted to get this, fill in the blank, you know what? And he's like, now I have the money. Now I have the means to get this. Back in right. the day, I could look at it at the store. I, I could, you could probably go to the stacks at Woolworths or something and look at the, at the, at the, at the cover and then you go, ah, oh, yeah, maybe if you had friends, you, everybody pony up a little money. Um, my friends and I, we did that with Woodstock. It was a, a double album. And it was, again, one of those breaking into the minds because you know, so much rock, so much early stuff and people that were unheard of before getting, you know, but, you know, it took us, I, I don't know how many neighborhood kids ponied up to get that two album <laughs> cover but yeah. now people can get all five of them so you don't have to hunt them all down and there's a bonus single and posters and all kinds of really cool stuff so this is a great opportunity but as we move from there also more importantly you also had diversified because you went into producing engineering you've got uh, you have a studio uh the seller Yes. And, you know, one last thing I want to mention about the box set. Mm -hmm. um, it's remastered oh, by wow. a gentleman named Andy Pierce. And he's done, I didn't realize this, but he's just got a very long career in remastering records. It, his discography is amazing. And he did a really good job because in layman's terms, he brought out the guitars more. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you can sort of hear them a little, a little better, if you will, or frequencies that you maybe didn't hear before. And of course, having this printed on vinyl brings out the low end a little nicer because vinyl records are known for having really nice low end. Yeah. You know, so the combination of the two makes for a really nice, fresh sounding set of records. So for those that you know may be on the fence. It's really, if you're going to get anything in the way of a box set or like sort of a best of, this would be the one to get because A, you've got the vinyl albums, which, you know, in one group, but not only that, you have the remastering, which sounds really, really good. And then, of course, we throw back a lot of old things from the old days, like, you know, the old KLOS bumper stickers <laughs> that had like, you know, band names on them with the rainbows, you yeah. know. So... You know, there's a laminate in there and like a guitar pick and there's a really nice sort of a tour program type of thing. And it's got a lot of pictures that the current and former members of the group provided to show some things that no one's ever seen before behind the scenes, if you will. Mm -hmm. So it's really a unique set of things put together and I highly recommend it just because it's so unique in, in and of itself. So... Uh, but getting back to the studio thing, I had always been a studio guy, <laughs> and I started really early on. One of the reasons was my brother Tom, who is an excellent singer-songwriter, began recording his bands on four-track reel-to-reels, the old off-cam reel-to-reels. And they had a very large group of excellent songs. You know... This business can be really tough. You know, here we are talking about a box set, 
But let me remind folks that there are a lot of musicians that have been in the trenches and sacrificed and gone to bat and done it multiple times and have just missed the ball. Yeah. You know? And they're, you know, and it's not because their music wasn't great or they shouldn't have had success. It was just a lot of what you just said, the timing, yeah. you know, the sort of the, the chain of events that, you know, sort of happened, right place, right time, you know. So that got me involved and aware of recording songs. And so at that time, I was well into songwriting, uh, but it was very difficult to get into a recording studio. That was like getting behind the gates of The Wizard of Oz, right? You know, was, you know uh, yeah, good luck, right? Yeah. So I, um, you know, started kind of working on four tracks anytime I could and trying to make them sound right. And boy, that was a challenge, you know, because there were so many things that even if you had a four track recorder, it didn't mean you had the preamp the compressor, the equalizer, the mixing board, and if you did have a mixing board, you had to make sure it was a, a, of enough quality to where it wouldn't like just ruin it, you know, so they yeah. help it, right? You know, so there were a lot of things that went into it, and I started recording using my brother Tom's gear, and as well as going in the studio when we could with the bands that I had. And from there, I eventually, to make the long story short, I don't want to bloviate too much, and forgive me if I do, no. you know, I was able to get a, a Tascam 244 yeah. for the studio, and I remember I went to the musicians' union to take a loan to buy an MXR drum machine. This is before MIDI. Yeah. Okay. You know, and my brother Tom and I had been using this one drum machine that was actually pretty much what you would consider to be a toy. Yeah. You program a beat into it, and it kept a steady beat going, so that was good enough. Yeah. Right? You know, so I just kept going and going. I got a cheap microphone, like a 57, and, you know, like an MXR Dynacom, that everything would go through the Dynacom, right? Because that was my only compressor, you know. And on and on I went. And what I started doing was I, as a bassist, it was really difficult to get your song ideas across to others in a band mm. playing it on bass. You know, so I'd be playing a bass line going, hey, you know, and the guitar part goes like this. You yeah. Know? So what I saw, started to do was just kind of demo out my ideas with guitar, bass, little drum machine, a, a lead vocal, maybe a background part, just to be able to come into rehearsal and play it so it would be easier to interpret the parts. So from there I kept going and I, you know, that led to a bigger studio and, you know, that led to an even a larger one. You know. <laughs> And eventually it got to the point where I had a state-of-the-art studio. You nice. Know? But there were a lot of steps in between that that led to that. Mm -hmm. uh, especially with the state-of-the-art, the current state-of-the-art at the time. You know, you had only so many options. And you'd go from a $2,500 piece of equipment to a $250,000 piece of equipment that was obviously completely out of reach. Yeah. Right? You know, so you did the best that you could with the tools that you had. And uh, I've always loved the studio, and that naturally got me into engineering. And when we were recording some of those rap records and various other session work that I had done and, and did at the time, I was already always really intrigued by how good those studios sounded. Right? Little did I know that it was a, the Studer machine and you know the Neve console and yeah. just this stuff. Even today, we just love because it sounds so musical. So I would go in these studios and I would come back home and say to myself, okay, hey, how can I get my studio to sound like that? <laughs> which, which is a joke, right? You know, yeah. But I would try. And so through trial and error, I really refined my techniques and, and figured out what worked and what didn't work. And uh, spent a lot of time perfecting the craft along with writing songs. Mm -hmm. You know, well, what happened was, you know, Try, try to leapfrog is that I had a 16 track machine, a Bostex half inch B16, and a Ramza console, and various compressors and reverbs and so forth. And again, you know, for those that know musicians here, equipment is expensive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and 
boy, you're like a kid in a candy store because, you know, it's like, well, that I want that compressor. Well, it's five grand. You know, oh, I well, I, I'd like to rent that compressor. <laughs> you know, so I got to the point where I was working with other bands because I love production. And so I eventually, in the mid-'80s, hooked up with a band called Love Hate. And I, I did some, some work for them, as well as others. And I got to the point where people were starting to come to my studio and were interested in making records. But they looked at my equipment, and I remember one time a group came in and they went, hey, where's the two-inch analog tape machine? And I went, oh, um, well, I don't have one. I use a half-inch machine. And that made me kind of start realizing that at a certain point, you got to go all in. Yeah. You know? And so that led to me getting a, an Atari MTR machine and a 24-track 2-inch MTR 90. And I got the Mark III, which is a beautiful version of that machine. And then I got a console, which is a DDA AMR24, which is 44 by 24 by 24, very large desk. And I actually bought that desk from Christine McVie in Fleetwood Mac. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So that was a production. Putting a, a professional studio together, it wasn't like you could go to, like, you know, a guitar center and start picking out equipment. <laughs> it didn't work that way. Yeah. You know? So, uh, you know, over time, I was able to piece together the key components that would lead to me owning a state-of-the-art professional studio. And uh, I did that with full knowledge that this was quite an investment. And if you didn't really have the wherewithal, the knowledge, the, the, the chops, if mm -hmm. you will, you would uh, therefore be a complete fool. <laughs> That's so much money. Yeah. You'd be better off probably buying a nice home, you know, or, you know, something like that. So A, fer a Ferrari? Yeah. Even a Ferrari. Because <laughs> right? you know, look at that baby. So, yeah. Uh, it was incremental. Yeah. And it was a, quite a responsibility. And then it, there came a point where that's how I made my living. You know, I, I've made a lot of records for independent labels, punk rock labels, you know, everything from country rock to R&B, you know. And so my love of the studio sort of led to, uh, you know, just working with a diverse group of musicians and bands. And back in those days, and we're talking now, you know, early 90s, there were a lot of independent labels and these independent labels didn't have a whole lot of money to make these what they really want. You know, they wanted a hundred thousand dollar record for twenty five hundred dollars, mm -hmm. right? You know, yeah. that kind of thing. So it, it opened up a, a unique market for me to be able to work with groups that weren't able to afford the, you know, the uh, the A and M's, you know, and the village recorders and the record plants, mm -hmm. but they get into a studio that could provide them enough technology to at least make a good sounding record. Yeah. And that was a great niche that I found and I had a, a really good time with a lot of different groups and learned a lot, you know, and, and learned a lot that you really wouldn't understand were you only in bands, okay? For example, and forgive me again, I feel like I'm bloviating, I apologize. Go for it, Juan, this is what we're talking. So the point is, is that a lot of times in art, there is no wrong and right. It's all about your perception of it. Mm -hmm. And so I eventually came to realize that even if I don't think it's as good as it could have been, as long as the artist is happy with his vision and it sounds to him how he hears it in his head, that's the most important thing. Yeah. You know, because it's art. So. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you, there's certain things like, you know, yeah, you're either in tune or you're not. You want to try <laughs> to be in tune, definitely. But, but, you know, beyond that, you know, it's all, it's just a, an art form that's open to perception, you know, obviously. So yeah. those are like one of the things that I kind of learned from production that, you know, sometimes you just got to cater to the artist's needs. And even though you know that if you went down this road, you could get more out of it and maybe even more appeal, but that's not what your job is. Your job is to keep the client happy 
and have him see his vision. Absolutely. Well, and it's interesting when you mention even the tuning because there's been quite a few live acts that if it weren't for auto-tune, you'd go, okay, what I heard on the record and what I'm hearing now, <laughs> fine. Yeah, you know, pick you a know, note, any note. <laughs> tell me, buddy, it's funny to mention that because one of the things that I became uh, pretty competent in was working with singers and making sure they were in pitch. And this is before auto-tune, <laughs> way before. This is when like a pit, you know, auto-tune was a pitch transposer, like an MXR pitch transposer. Yeah. And definitely it didn't work for vocalists. You know, if you wanted an octave effect, it was good for that. But anything else, forget it. So I would painstakingly go through each line with singers when they needed it, when they had pitch issues, mm -hmm. you know. And sometimes I would have to punch in words, you know, and it became a very delicate art form because... You know, it was destructive overdubbing. Yeah. So unlike Pro Tools, where you can keep the take before, oh, no. Once you're in and out, that previous take, gone. Yeah. Right? So it became sort of an art form to keep the singer comfortable, keep up his confidence, get him through a vocal performance, and have it be in pitch, in tune. So... Yeah, I mean, a lot of people think auto-tune, and there's a reason for that, because without it, you know, you'd spend, I mean, we'd spend weeks sometimes with singers just trying to get them to sound right. Oh. You know, an example of that, Raul, is that a lot of bands be jamming loud, and they'd be doing live performances, and many bands didn't record themselves even. You know, back then, there was, you know, nobody even had a video camera, yeah. you know. So they'd be playing, thinking the other guy's cool too and everything's going great. Then they get in the studio and they go, oh, uh, our singer doesn't sound right. <laughs> something's wrong. Yeah, he's out of key. <laughs> you know. So they would discover these things and upon getting in the studio for many folks, it became very intimidating. All of a sudden, they're hearing me and they're hearing my real voice or my real guitar playing or my solos like out front and naked. You know, so part of the job, you know, that came along with it was making people feel comfortable and getting the best performance out of them. And uh, not always easy. Sometimes it would take a long time. And then, you know, bands would try to shop deals. And, you know, it was like that magical, that brass ring that everyone was trying to reach, yeah. you know. And it started with the live performance, but eventually got to the demo. And if your demo didn't have it, boy, that was going to, you know, the doors would be locked for you. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and moving away from that, because that's a whole, obviously, you've been so busy in the, in the hustle. And again, it's a diversified portfolio where while you're playing, doing studio stuff, but bringing us even more current date, you're playing. Tell us a little bit about what you've got going on now. Yeah. So I've had my own band and various incarnations of it. For a very long time, probably uh, in the neighborhood of 26 years plus. So now I'm in the planning stages to move uh, my solo band forward. Okay. And uh, so we're starting to book dates. We're hoping to get some dates in the fall and just moving on. Uh, you know, it's interesting because I've sort of seen both sides of the fence in real time. You know, uh, on the one hand, with a band like Rat, Obviously, it commands the brand and our history of recording and whatnot commands a certain venue and a certain amount of people. And, you know, you got your festivals and, you know, things like that. Yeah. And then you've got your other band, in this case, my solo band, which may not command uh, quite the same audience and quite the same amount of people. But that's not why I do it. I do it because I love music. Okay, and if I can get out there and at least cover my expenses, you know, put gas in the van and pay for the flights and, you know, hotel and whatnot, I'm good with that because I love music. And when you have that passion, that love for music, you know, it's great to make a living. And of course, everybody needs to and wants to and should, mm -hmm. you know, but there's times that it goes beyond that. You're doing it for the love of music and to, to share something that you feel 
people will appreciate and enjoy and will make their lives or, you know, their, their time, if you will, a little better. Give them a break from the trials and tribulations that life can throw at us, right? Sure. You know, so I know that there are musicians that sort of say, well, look, if I can't tour on this level, you know, I would rather just stay home with my wife and kids, you know. And I understand that, yeah. you know, but I, I try to find a balance, you know, no matter where. And it's great. Rat has done something that is very special. And the odds were totally against us always. And we were, you know, five young, determined guys that wouldn't take no for an answer. You know, but things change and, time, you know, times and trends just sort of evolve. And so then you reach the point where you say, you know, it'd be great if we could maintain this and sustain this. But, you know, Rat's got a, a history that's, you know, 40 plus years. Imagine working with the people that you first started working with when you got your first job out of high school. Mm. Yeah. You know, a lot of people would go, uh, yeah, no, no, that ain't going to happen. Okay. So it, it's not easy to maintain that. And in the end, what the common denominator is our love for music. And so whether I go out with my solo band or I go out with, a, you know, a band like Rat, it doesn't really matter because the point is the music's the most important thing. So I'm planning on doing some shows here and hopefully in the fall and continuing from there. I've got a great band. I've got uh, two great guitar players. Tony Aleman is a lead guitar player. Mike Moore is the other guitar player, fantastic guitar player. I've got P. Holmes on drums mm -hmm. and of course I'm playing bass and singing. So we've been doing it, you know, and sort of stopped to give Rat some space to do its thing. But from this point on out, I'm just going to focus on things that, you know, that are musically rewarding to me. So I intend on releasing a lot of new music that I've had in the pipeline. You know, oddly enough, I'm one of those guys that it's not writing the song that's difficult. It's not recording the song that's difficult, even though recording the song is difficult. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. It's, it's just finding the right timing in things, you know. And as we evolve in life, there are other things that require our attention, you know. So when you're a young man and you've got nothing but time, you know, yeah. it's easy to have a lot of output and just sort of that becomes your baby, you know. But when you actually have a family and and things that require uh, your attention. Time management is really important. So my intention was to have my solo band playing over a year ago. However, because of what happened with COVID and a lot of people ramping up and, and uh, getting back out on tour, I wasn't able to get the dates that I was expecting to get. So at this point, you know, I'm just picking up the pieces and moving forward. And, uh, you know, I, again, I just do it because I love music. And, and that's one of those things where once it's in your blood, you know, it's it just that's it. You yeah, know? it's yeah. it's never gone. Well, and I suppose one of the most important things, if people want to know where you're going to be, where's the best place for them to look? Oh, yeah. You know, I'm obviously on social media like all of us virtually are. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I got a Facebook page. There's a... Uh, my website, juancrucier.com. There's also ratsjuancrucier.com, which is more my solo band mm -hmm. website. And we've got a Twitter page. You know, so we've got all the, the usual contact points. And I'll be updating things as we get more shows uh, coming through the pipeline. You know, I just want to make sure to have something to announce, you know. Oh, I'm also, by the way, going to re-release an EP that I did some time ago. So that should be fun. And, you know, just trying to stay busy. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And I do want to remind people also, if they're looking for the box set and all this, uh, one of the key points is the rat pack.com. I believe that's, that's, that's the web page to check that out. And certainly if you have saved up your money since the eighties, now you can afford to get the box set with all of the extra goodies and great things. So Juan, we appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. You're Thank obviously you. ongoing with the hustle every moment, brother. 
Folks, you've seen him here, Juan Crucier on Bass Musician Magazine. Thank you, Raul. It's been my pleasure, and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much for everything. My pleasure, man.